Welcome back, everybody. Tobin and Leroy here with you on 560 WQAM. Take you up until 2 o'clock here on the show. I'll let you guys know if you guys want to win tickets to David Blaine, extreme illusionist, stunt artist, legendary magician. He's at his first ever residency in Las Vegas. David Blaine in spades exclusively at the Resorts World Theater to win. Go to the Odyssey app. You log in and listen to WQAM for every hour you listen. You'll get another entry in the contest to win in the drawing. The more you listen to WQM, the more chances you have to win. David Blaine in spades is playing April 28th through July 15th. Tickets on sale now at rwlasvegas.com or axs.com. Check that on out. All right, let's go out to the Toilet of Hollywood guest line. Shop over 1,500 toilets indoors in one of America's largest showrooms at Toilet of Hollywood on 441 between Hollywood and Sheridan. Or Miami Hurricanes, great or Dolphin, Raven, Viking, Brian McKinney joining us here on the show as he's got some uh, great stuff coming up later on this week with his foundation as they're having a uh, cocktails and conversation at the Hard Rock uh, Dare Nightclub this Thursday. Brian, what's going on, man? How are you? Hey, how you doing? We actually just moved it to the um, it's in the Hard Rock stores in one of the ballrooms now. Ballrooms, um, okay. We added that because of something that was taking place in there. Uh, but definitely we're having something called Cocktails and Conversation where we discuss mental health, um, mental health awareness, things like that. I have uh, a clinical social worker um, named Dr. Tasha Alexander, along with the psychologist, Dr. Tasha um, Harris, um, Brandon Marshall from NFL Player, and two reality friends of mine, reality stars, Shay Johnson from Flavor of Love, Love & Hip Hop, who has a health and wellness brand, and Renee Graziano from My Wives, who have dealt with her own issues in mental health, um, you know, area. And then Dr. Marvin Smith, um, orthopedic surgeon. He's going to be on the panel as well. Very cool. Well, what would you, what made you, uh, want to make this a focus for you, Brian? Like why, why was uh, mental health awareness such a big deal to you? Um, when I retired, there was a couple other guys who retired around the same time as me and two different guys had this like issues. Uh, one got bigger act and I had to actually go down and talk to him um, at the psych ward, and he didn't want to talk to his family because he felt like they couldn't relate, and um, he only felt comfortable talking to me. And I guess when you are the individual who's the strong person where everybody looks to as the go-to person in the family, it's like, I guess, what do I want to talk to them for? So kind of opened up to me, and I realized this was a real need, not just in the football space, but just in general. And I just felt like this conversation that, you know, that we should probably start having a little more often so people can go see about, you know, getting some therapy and, not feeling alone. You think it's one of those situations where, you know, I always thought when I got done with football that you find out what guys you are really close to versus guys you just associate with because when y'all start dealing with real life issues, if you don't have, if if your boy when you play football isn't the same boy you could go to and have those conversations, then you end up even lonelier than you were when you were in that locker room. And, and, and so you think that, you know, this will help, you know, actually people identify not only what they're going through, but who they could talk to as far as people in their lives. Um, I agree. I agree to um, a certain extent. I feel like a lot of times people miss the locker room um, vibe because you're no longer a part of it. So, like, I'm part of the NFL choir as well. So, we were on America's Got Talent. <laughs> and um, just having those moments of guys being able to be back around each other for rehearsal and stuff like that, it kind of let guys, like, kind of appreciate and actually miss the locker room. Um, but I feel like each guy, while you're playing, you kind of know who you're cool with and who, who you kind of aren't. Like, some people are just, you know, work employees and some are, like, your friends. So, you have an idea who you can kind of rely on. But just not having that environment anymore. And that's the environment a lot of people kind of grew up in for majority of their life. And then that's now being removed or taken away. Um, it's like, now who do I talk to? The people who depend on me all the time. And I, I want to, I'd rather talk to somebody who I can relate to or probably going to do similar things and see how they got through it. Right. Like uh, the choir thing, like that's, uh, you, I mean, you've always been like around uh, the music, but like, when did you, uh, you find that after, after playing the, the, the 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 choir and and how much um, does that like help with you? you well you know what's funny is with the choir thing it the, the nfl choir has been around for a while it's, it's going on 25 years next year 
So I, I joined back in 2007, the Lady Melanie Few put it together. Her mom, my mom and her were friends. So I, I joined back then. But it was always during the Super Bowl time and things like that. We did events here and there. But I felt like when it got on AGT, it became more of a thing or more people knew about it. But um, now since being retired, because this is made up of former and current players, that some of the former players actually enjoy and like look forward to like the trips and things like that because it gives you a chance to kind of feel like you're back in the locker room again and people are able to kind of like, you know, talk and network and see what's going on and seeing how, how each other are feeling mentally. And, I, and just being around that again, just made me realize like these conversations are important because, you know, people just talk about how to, they went through depression. So you have to look at it. If you, I started playing in high school, but if I started at six years old and I've identified myself as an athlete or a football player or whatever, since six, and then now it gets taken away at a certain point in my life. It's like, who am I? So I feel like a lot of people go through that. Mm-hmm. Brian, I got a question for you. Did you get a haircut right before this interview, bro? That is the cleanest tape I've seen. Oh, thanks. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, uh, like you, mentioned that you're, you mentioned that you're working with Dr. Tasha, correct? Is that uh, Tasha Harris? I think she did something called drive-by therapy or something no, like that. She does drive-by so, therapy. I did a couple of those shows at the uh, Dania Beach Improv uh, with Dr. Tasha. Is this a similar concept in which you're attempting to kind of like normalize talking about things that you uh, necessarily wouldn't do in a public setting? Is that essentially what this event is like? Um, That and then also so people can kind of figure out like, okay, you know, some people might want to come here just to listen, you know what I mean? So they'll feel like, oh, they went through this and see how people got through things, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's so similar, yeah, but like have open discussion as well as just allowing people to be there as a spectator or a visitor or listener and just learn some things and gather some information from it. And even if they want knowledge on how to get or seek help, at least have that available to them as well. Talking to Brian McKinney, this event is coming up on uh, Thursday at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, one of the ballrooms over there. Uh, what's the best way that pe- uh, people can get tickets, Brian? Is there, is there, they go through social uh, they media? They go to um, thebryantmckinney.com and they can purchase tickets on there. And on my flyer, if you use the um, QR code, it'll take you straight to a link as well. Uh, see you rocking the cane shirt, uh, Brian. How is uh, how excited are you for? You been to spring game at all? Like uh, Chris Ball, your guy there now, uh, running the show year two. Uh, how how excited are you for 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 year two of the Crystal Ball era? I'm pretty excited. I know they have the spring game this weekend coming up. Um, I believe it's on Friday, so I'm excited. I'm excited to see you know how he's able to turn the team around because I believe he will. I feel like he's a great recruiter, and I feel like he also teaches those guys about hard work and discipline. He also played a big role. In my career at the University of Miami, so I definitely support him and want to see him do well. He is a guy who was a two-time national champion as a player and one as a coach, so he knows what the hard work looks like as a player and as a coach. So I think he'll do great. Yeah, you guys all seem to have uh, a lot, like all the all the former Canes. How close you guys are together? Like you seem to have a lot of faith in him, obviously, because you know how passionate he is about it. Like mm-hmm. how hard do you think last year was on him, knowing that you know it wasn't maybe off to the start that he wanted to, some real tough losses in there, but also he probably had to get things I just, his way. I just feel like it's hard for a coach to come in on year one and try to turn everything around and expect it to be like right back just because he got there. Like I always say you have to give him at least three years, you know, to get some of those guys in that are his guys. And like the guys who are freshmen, by the time they're juniors, the program should be getting to heading into like a greater direction. That offensive line is always a question, too. Like, when I, you were, like, a phenom in college. So like, you never – nobody ever touched the quarterback when you were in there. But mm-hmm. with uh, when you watch these young kids today, like, do you feel like it is it a tougher jump to college than it used to be? Or, or is that something that you hear from Coach? Because that's that's kind of his bag. He loves the O-line. Yeah, cause I always say the O-line is the engine. Car can't start without the engine. You know what I mean? So, um, I just feel like it's a lot more distraction nowadays. You know what I'm saying? As far as – Social media. Now you have NIL. It's like, I don't know how I would feel if I'm black for somebody. They're making like five million. I'm not making nothing. Like, it's a lot of things that sep- that can separate the team. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We did things a lot that brought us together. Like, we would hang out. Like, you know, Joaquin and Reed and all those guys came up to New Jersey with me. Like, and first time I had Cuban food was at Joaquin. But, like, we did things together. Well, I feel like it's a lot of separation with the newer generation of of like of players where I feel like they should do more things outside of the locker room, like, which we did. And I feel like it's important, but um, we didn't have as many distractions that like, we try to create things to do, you know, amongst us. And I feel like they, I hope they start taking notes from that. Yeah. That's a good point because like nobody ever gives love to the old line. And they're like, who's going to give an NIL though to, to, to the monsters of right. like 
you I could definitely see that being a thing. Like the, you know, we <laughs> with the quarterbacks, like I know you guys get some nice gifts every once in a while from a QB in the NFL locker room, but they may need to start that early of like the, the trickle down if the QB really wants you guys protected for. Right. Let's figure something out. Like you getting this big deal, like shoot something. <laughs> believe me, believe me, the farther along you get in football, the more people acknowledge and identify why it's all done. And they always go up front. When you look at the NFL, for example, the O-line in most cases, most of them getting paid more than the running back. Mm -hmm. You know, and you got sometimes your left, your left tackle is making more than the quarterback. Like- I don't know about that part. Well, no, I'm talking that. about like <laughs> early on. Early on, I'm uh -huh. talking about early on. <laughs> like early oh, on until they get their, their big deal. But- Every quarterback doesn't get to that extension. Right. So a lot of times that staple is that left tackle, not necessarily the quarterback, and he always going to make money. I could probably tell you Joe Thomas probably always made more money than his quarterback. That's probably why he never won a playoff game. But mm. – <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brian, what are you, uh, one of the big stories out there, one of your former teams, the Ravens, uh, Lamar Jackson, like what have you made of that whole ordeal? Like I know they got Odell this weekend, so maybe that'll smooth some things, but what have you made of that whole situation of them not taking care of Lamar yet and, and his whole deal? I do think the Odell factor is something to kind of smooth things over to, to entice him to stay because now we did give, we gave you a weapon so far and then you still got the draft coming up. Um in my mind, I would have thought they would have did something to try to take care of it before the contract ran all the way out. But um, I don't, I don't understand what the logic is between that. But they're gonna have to figure something out. But I do think that that was a, a part having Odell there it was a part of trying to entice him to like you know not want to leave. Brian, here's the crazy thing about it: if if you Lamar Jackson and you look throughout the league, no other quarterback of his nature he even ever made it to this point. So the Ravens could have redid his contract two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And and would only probably have to give him 130, 140 guaranteed. But then they waited and they waited and they waited and all these other contracts got done. And now they're in a crazy position now because they want to go back and offer the 140. Right. And times have changed. And, and so it is... I think it's a, a misstep by the Ravens mm -hmm. by not taking care of their guy. They should have gave him a contract right after the MVP year. They should have. Um, and you got to look at it now. How does that player feel that you didn't want to take care of right. him? And I had to go through all this back and forth with you guys. When I've come in, I've made the offensive side more exciting for you know people to tune in and watch. Right. So why are we not taking care of me? But, and, and that's and and that that petty right there. I don't know if that just goes away because he got some, some, you know, you get some hurt feelings when you see everybody else getting taken care of. And yet you've been more productive than some of those guys mm -hmm. and you not getting taken care of like they are. I, I, I think I can see where feelings get into it. I don't know oh, how they're going to do it. I think the only thing fix it is money. It'll fix it, but then at the same time, you're still like, well, why do I have to go through all this? Right. You know, just to get this mm -hmm. done. I feel like I've done my part. Right. Um, I think they should have handled that a while ago. I feel like they should have handled that even sometime during the season last year and not not let it get all the way to the end of the season. I mean, even when I was with the Vikings, they redid my contract before my season was up. So it was like, I just knew that's what was going to happen to him. Right. It, that, it, that's what we all thought. We all thought, uh oh. You better hurry up and do Lamar's contract before so and so sign. You better do it because if if so and so sign, he got an MVP. He's gonna have to get more than him. Right. But for some reason, the Ravens didn't think like that. They always thought that what they priced him out to 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 be, or what they thought they was gonna have to pay him, that was gonna last forever. In a, in the words of Fat Joe, yesterday's price is not today's price. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Go That's check right. out. Uh, Go check out Brian McKinney's uh, event, an evening of cocktails and conversation at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino coming up on Thursday, 8 o'clock. Anything else you want to tell us about the event, Brian, before we get you out of here, uh, get people out there info on how to get tickets or anything else you want to just say about it before we get you uh, out of here? Much, I think it will just be a great experience. Um, you get to hear just different stories, and it's, it's going to be open discussion as well, too, so we'll get to hear from the audience and kind of get some feedback on things. And um, 
just make sure they go to thebryanmckinney.com. You can purchase tickets there, or you can use the QR code on the flyer and purchase the tickets or donate. <laughs> Appreciate it, Brian. Thanks so much, man. Good luck Thanks. with the event. You're doing some good Thank work you. there. Thank you for having me.